The Ghost in the Mirror by John Belair's Chapter 4. Before the cart had gone very far, Herman Weiss muttered, Uh-oh, here comes old Adolphus Stolzfus. He sounded both worried and annoyed, and his black-gloved hands tightened their grip on the horse's reins. Another horse-drawn vehicle was approaching a farm wet was approaching a farm wagon, painted a cheerful bright yellow. Piled high in the wagon were in the wagon bed were bulging burlap sacks stuffed full of what looked stuffed full and looking like fat brown pillows. The man driving the wagon was about seventy, tall and skinny, and the horse that drew the wagon was a deep-chested white mare whose ribs showed through the skin. Mr. Weiss edged the cart over to the right as far as he could. The wagon swung wide to pass them. The scowling wagon driver glared their way, shaking his long, bony chin at them. As the two drivers came side by side, the old man in the wagon raised his fist and growled, Why don't you get that bitch out of the country? Then he added something that sounded to Rosarita like, Du Amates. Mr. Weiss stared straight ahead and did not reply but his jaw clenched and his hands trembled as they held the reins. A moment later, the wagon had safely passed, and Mr. Weiss shook the reins and clicked his tongue. Get up, Nicholas, he said. We will be late for supper. The chestnut horse picked up the pace, and the cart rattled along at a good clip. The exchange astonished, the exchange astonished Rose Rita. How in the world had the skinny man known that Mrs. Zimmerman was a witch? No one could tell by looking at her. She certainly didn't look anything like a storybook witch with a pointed black hat and a tattered black cane and, and a scraggly broom. Huddled beneath the brown blanket, she might have been just about anyone one or anything, but the man had told Weiss to get that witch out of the country. As far as Rose Rita could see, the witch had to be her, had to be her friend. Before long, Mr. Weiss pointed ahead to an enormous rock off, on the left of the ro- off to the left of the road. It was a snow-streaked chunk of granite size of a small house. That is Cottage Rock, he said. It is on my land. We turn for the house there. Just past the rock, the cart swerved to the left, onto a little used path with only a, cu- a couple of wagon ruts showing through, the cur- th- showing through the crusted snow. Not far now, Mr. Weiss said over his shoulder. Rose Rita thought that his voice was no longer light and pleasant, but heavy and sorrowful. She wondered if what the other driver had said about Mrs. Zimmerman had upset him. Though she accepted Mrs. Zimmerman's magic as just part of her friend's life, she knew many people were strongly prejudiced against witches of all types. She began to be afraid that the wife's family would change its mind about giving them a meal, and she dreaded the thought of walking any farther through the snow. Soon, farm buildings appeared ahead of them, beyond a wide, snow-covered lawn studded with bare chestnut trees. Rosrita saw a white, plastered house, two stories tall and with two wings, and behind it, a barn, that was stone for the first story and red-painted wood for the second. Unlike many of the barns in the area, this one bore no hex signs on its red wooden sides. To the right of the barn were a few other outbuildings and sheds, and the cart headed for one of these. Mr. Weiss halted Nicholas before a broad stable door and turned to his daughter. Hilda, I will put up the horse and feed him. You take our visitors to see Mama and tell her we will have guests tonight. For the first time, Hilda spoke. All right, Papa. She had a very clear and sweet voice, and her German accent was not as pronounced as her father's. She climbed down and waited while Rose Rita and Mrs. Zimmerman descended from the wagon. This way, she said. She kept stealing shy glances at Rose Rita. Are you English? She asked, in, a, in little more than a whisper. What? Rose Rita asked, surprised. Do I sound English? Mrs. Zimmerman laughed. <laughs> Hilda wants to know if you're one of her people. They call anyone who isn't Pennsylvania Dutch English. By that definition, I suppose you'd say both of us are English. Hilda, we come from a small town called New Zebedee, a long, long way from here. Do the girls in this place all wear trousers? Hilda asked, stealing another look at Rosarita's attire. Rosarita blushed. They do if they want to, she said. Anyway, wearing jeans is a lot more comfortable in cold weather. They had reached the back door of the house. Hilda scraped her shoes and stamped off the loose snow, and then she led them inside. At first, Rosrita could hardly see, because even the weak sunlight outside had reflected off the snow so brightly that everything inside was dark by comparison. To complicate matters, her glasses fogged up. In the dimness, an impression of warmth and bustle swept over her. She could tell from the chatter they had entered a house with lots of people in it. After a moment, a child yelled, Mama, Hilda has brought strangers in. Rosrita took off her spectacles and used the hem of her sweatshirt to rub the mist from them. Then she put, or she 
put the glasses back on and blinked. A portly woman came bustling in, drying her hands on a towel. Hilda, you look half frozen. Who are these you brought in? What is your papa doing? How was lawyer Newton Haas? What did you say about gra- what did he say about Grandpa Drexel? Are your boots wet? Does it look as if it was snow again? Hilda picked just one question to answer. She said, Mama, this is Florence Zimmerman, and Miss Rose Rita Pottinger. Papa and I found them walking on the road. They're lost. They've lost their way. Papa says they're to have supper with us and stay here tonight. Mrs. Weiss put her hands to her head. Chatter, chatter, chatter. Och, girl, you make my head break with all your talking one day. But if we have guests, then, they mu- then we must make it ready for them. Hilda, go and mind the stew and tell Sarah to put two more places on the table. Hurry now. Hilda gave Mrs. Zimmerman and Rose Rita a parting smile and went through the doorway from which Mrs. Weiss had emerged. Mrs. Weiss tucked a loose strand of her gray blonde hair back into place and smiled. Hello, Mrs. Zimmerman. I am Susanna Weiss. Are you related to the Hanover Zimmermans? No, of course. They are all Amish, aren't they? Lost, were you? How dreadful. And the weather so terrible. That so terribly cold, too. Have you ever seen so much unsettled weather in late February? Ah, we have had troubles this year. I don't mind telling you. Never mind, though. You are welcome. And Rosarita, your granddaughter. Then, I have two daughters about her age, or a little older, twins. And their names are Rebecca and Sarah. Rosarita is my grandniece, said Mrs. Zimmerman, who had decided that Hilda's approach of answering just one of Mrs. Weiss's inquiries might be the best one. Actually, she's sort of my adopted grandniece. How nice, Mrs. Weiss said. You know my stepfather lives with us, Grandpa Drexel. Oh, how the poor old fellow has suffered. He has not been well at all this whole winter. My mother's second husband he was, but... To me, a loving father, nonetheless, my own father died when I was only two, so I do not even remember him, God bless him, but Mr. Drexel has always been just like a papa to me. Poor man, he does not deserve all this trouble and worry. I hope you both like hot mummocks. It's plain fair, but we have plenty of it, and it will warm you on such a cold day. Papa, here you are. Mr. Weiss had come inside and stood beside Mrs. Zimmerman and Rose Rita. He took off his wide-brimmed hat and hung it on a peg. He embraced Mrs. Mrs. Weiss and gave her a quick peck on the cheek. I hope supper is almost ready, he said. It's a cold ride from Lower Nutton House's place. Papa? asked Mrs. Weiss. Mr. Weiss made a sad face and shook his head. Mrs. Weiss sighed deeply. Rosarita felt puzzled. For a woman who used so many words, Mrs. Weiss seemed to get a word of meaning from a shake of, a, of the head. With another sigh, Mrs. Weiss turned to her two visitors. In a more subdued voice, she said, Mrs. Zimmerman, there is hot water in the washroom beside the kitchen. You and your niece can wash your hands and faces there. Come, I'll show you. They went through the kitchen, where what seemed like a dozen children swarmed all over the place. Some of them were putting wood into a cast iron stove. Some were stirring pots, and others were running back and forth with hands full of dishes and sil- or silverware. One boy paused and stared hard at Rose Rita. Och, he said timidly, what a wonderful hat she has. Rosarita had forgotten the beanie. She snatched it off her head and stuffed it under her topmost sweatshirt. Then she followed Mrs. Zimmerman into the washroom. After the bustle in the kitchen, the dark little room behind the stove was quiet by comparison. Mrs. Weiss poured some hot water into a basin, gave Mrs. Zimmerman a plain towel, and then hurried back into the kitchen. As soon as she was out of earshot, Rosarita said, Mrs. Zimmerman, how did that man on the road, that, Ad- that Adolphus Hoosus, know that you were a witch? Mrs. Zimmerman took off her improvised scarf. I don't think he met me. I think the Weisses are having witch trouble of another kind. Here, you can dry your hands on Toledo. I'll use the linen towel myself. Rosarita took the towel and wiped her hands. What kind of witch troubles? I'll tell you later, said Mrs. Mrs. Zimmerman replied. Let's go into supper. I'm starved. Rosarita was not hungry, not after the, sh- the shock of all she had been through that day, and especially not for something called mummox, which sounded strange and rather Egyptian to her. But because she did not know what else to do, she seated herself on one of the long wooden benches drawn up to the heavily laden table. The wife's children already sat on that bench and the one across from the long table. The children's names were hard to keep straight. Rose Rita sat between Rebecca, who was 16, and Hilda on the far side of Rebecca with Sarah, her identical twin. Across from them was Heinrich, a pale and skinny 10-year-old, 
whose look of apprehension reminded Rose Rita of her chubby friend, Louis. Heinrich was the one who had been so visibly impressed by her beanie. Two older boys sat beside Heinrich. Their names were Hans and Jacob, but Rose Rita could not remember who was who. Mrs. Zimmerman was on the other side of Hilda. Mrs. Weiss sat next to her. Mr. Weiss disappeared for a few moments and then came back with an elderly man leaning on his arm. The old man looked frail, but his blue eyes were bright. He was thin and unsteady on his legs. Once Mr. Weiss had seen him, had seen him into a chair at the foot of the table, he said, This is Grandpa Drexel, my wife's stepfather. Grandpa Drexel, these are our guests, Mrs. Zimmerman, and her grandniece, Rosarita. Grandpa Drexel smiled at both of them and gave them a courteous nod. But when he gave Mrs. Zimmerman, Mrs. Zimmerman a second look, he seemed startled. Rosarita noticed the old man kept glancing back at her with a suspicious look in his eyes. Mr. Weiss took his place at the head of the table and said a long grace. By the time he had finished, Rosarita had changed her mind about not being hungry. Mummox turned out to be a sort of beef stew with potatoes, piping hot and savory. Mrs. Weiss also served a hot cabbage slaw, buttered peas, freshly baked brown bread with fresh creamy butter, and fat brown apple dumplings. Rosarita ate just as heartily as the girls on either side of her. Near the end of the meal, one of the older boys said, Papa, what about the lawyer? Mr. Weiss shook his head. Not now, Hans. We do not wish to discuss our troubles in front of guests. Mrs. Zimmerman, I'm glad we could help you. How did you come to be in such a predicament? Not many people travel to the Mount Kidron Road in the winter time. Mrs. Zimmerman coughed into her napkin. <clears throat> I suppose that is true. We are strangers here and, and I didn't, and didn't know that. We come from a good way west of here. Rosarita and I wanted to uh, look up some of my relatives in the Cumberland Valley, but we have had a bit of an accident. No wonder, said Mrs. Weiss. Ach, the road is treacherous when it freezes. I remember one time when Reverend Helmholtz, you remember, Joseph Helmholtz Herman, who took Pastor Brunning's place that winter. Anyway, his horse slipped and the poor man fell and broke his leg. Two miles he had to crawl before he found someone to help him. Grandpa Drexel spoke up for the first time in a kindly but weak voice. Susanna, let our visitor finish, please. Mrs. Weiss blushed even pinker than she had been. I'm sorry, Papa Drexel. I know I talk too much. Not at all. No, not at all, said Mrs. Zimmerman. She was glad for the diversion. She had no idea how to explain an automobile accident to these people who had never seen a gasoline engine. Was it a bad accident? Young Heinrich asked Rose Rita. Well, our uh, carriage ran off the road, Rose Rita said. We were coming downhill and the curve was really icy, so we sort of slipped. Rebecca looked at her with wide eyes. What happened to the horse? she asked. Rose Rita suddenly noticed that she had everyone's attention. She prided herself on her imagination. Now she set it free. Well, it's a funny thing about that horse, she said. He was in a bad accident once before, and he had to stay in his stall for months and months. Now, whenever there's even a little accident, he thinks he's hurt, and he hides and won't move. You left him in the snow? Hilda asked in a shocked voice. Uh, no, Rose Rita said. I mean, he always runs back to the stable at home and hides there. And then we have to bring him his oats and tray every morning until he feels well enough to come outside again. He, Rose Rita, broke off. They were all staring at her, and Mrs. Zimmerman was making little no-no gestures with her head. Only Mr. Drexel at the foot of the table was smiling in an understanding way. He cleared his throat, and everyone looked his way. <clears throat> I believe I know what the young lady means, he said, and touched his forehead with a bony finger. Rosarita looked down and felt her face go hot. Grandpa Drexel was telling everyone she was touched. Fortunately, Mrs. Weiss broke in with a long comment about the unusually harsh winter, and soon the conversation moved on to other subjects. After dinner, Rosarita and Mrs. Zimmerman insisted on helping the Weisses clean up. In turn, Mr. and Mrs. Weiss insisted that they were that they both stay with them as long as they needed to. Rosarita can share Hilda's bedroom. That once belonged to the twins before we built the new part of the house. So there is an extra bed, Mrs. Weiss said, and you, Mrs. Zimmerman, can sleep in our Trinka's old room. Trinka is our eldest, and she is married and moved away now. Ah, her husband is such a nice young man. One weird thing happened as Rosarita was drying dishes. She noticed a calendar hanging on the wall. Behind the old, old sink, behind the odd old sink with its hand-operated pump, the calendar said the year was 1828. 
Rosarito Rita leaned over for a closer look. All the days had been crossed off up to February 23rd. Uh, up to February 23rd. Is that the right date? She asked Hilga. Yeah, the 23rd, Sarah said, pouring more hot water into the sink. They went to bed not long after that. A cheery little fire burned in the small fireplace. The room smelled of oak and pine and peppermint and was comfortably warm. Hilda lent Rose Rita a fuzzy flannel nightgown, and Mrs. White brought in a big stack of colorful quilts to keep her cozy through the night. After Hilda blew out her candle, the only light in the room was the reddish flickering of the fire. Eventually, even that burnt down to just a glow. The girls talked a little in the darkness. Finally, Rose Rita got up the nerve to ask, Why did your father go to see a lawyer? Hilda said, Because people are saying Grandpa Drexel is a hexa. A what? Rose Rita asked. She knew the word, but she was interested in knowing more about pen Dutch magic. Hilda's voice sounded sleepy. You know a bad witch. All sorts of bad luck hap- has happened this winter. Many people's cattle and chickens have sickened and died for no reason. There are even some people who have fallen ill. There have been dozens of mysterious fires in people's barns and houses, and even the schoolhouse it burned to the ground two weeks ago. Sometimes I wish my school would burn down, Rosarita confessed. Well, Hilda admitted, I don't mind so much, but people say the weather is hexed too. One day it will be warm, almost like spring, and then we have a terrible blizzard. I don't understand, Rosarita objected. What has this bad luck got to do with seeing a lawyer for a long time? Hilda did not answer. Then in a weepy voice, she replied, I told you they say my grandpa is a hex witch, that he has been doing black magic to cause all these awful things. People want us to leave our home. Hilda was sobbing. Rosarita felt terrible. She had not intended to hurt Hilda's feelings. I'm sorry, she said. Hilda sniffled. Papa wanted to see lawyer not in us to see if the lawyer not in us could bring some legal action to make people stop talking about my grandpa. But he said there was no law against gossip, and he told Papa to ignore what people are saying. Well, of course, I mean, your Grandpa Drexel isn't really a witch, is he? Rosary asked. No, not a hexer, but I'm frightened all the same. What if they chase us out of our house? What will become of us? Rosarita bit her lip. She, too, was in trouble. She and Mrs. Zimmerman were lost in this strange world with no way home. That's all right, she said, trying to sound brave. We'll find some way out of this mess. Thank you, Hilda whispered. Rosarita blinked in the dark. She had been talking to herself, but now somehow felt that Hilda was right. To solve her own problem, Rita was going to have to help Hilda solve hers. She lay there in the dark, trying to figure out some way of doing this. A long time later, warm and snug under all the quilts, Rosarita at last drifted off to sleep. She had not even begun to find a way out of all the trouble. And that's the end of chapter four.